All right, welcome back folks. It is time for a fourth video in our little AR-10 build series. Back in video number one, we assembled the lower. Video number two, we assembled the upper. And then in video three, we test fired the gun. I'd have to say things have gone pretty well so far. The gun went together, no problems, no fitment issues or incompatible parts or anything of that nature. But the accuracy in the last video was not good. We tested bullets from 110 grains. This first upper is 308, right? So 30 caliber. We tested bullets from 110 grains all the way up to 175 grains. The gun shot very poorly, two plus inch groups, all the way up until the last group with 175 grain bullets shot about an inch group. So that's why we're back here today for a fourth video. We're gonna test a variety of heavier bullets. And hopefully we're just in a situation where this gun, this barrel, it just likes heavier bullets. Now, our barrel, is an 18 inch ballistic advantage with a one in 10 twist. So we should be just fine up to these heavy bullets. And if we find that it just likes the heavier ones, that won't be a huge surprise. Now in the last video, I talked a little bit about replacing this barrel. If, uh, if the groups in today's video don't change our mind, we'll probably be pulling this barrel out. Now the main reason for this, there it is, there's our 18 incher. The reason why, this barrel was donated by Aaron. He had installed this barrel, tested this barrel, it didn't shoot well for him and he pulled it out, replaced it with something else. So that's why this barrel's coming in with a bad reputation. Now we do have a bore scope and later in this video, I wanna go ahead and have a close look at this barrel with the bore scope. We'll save it for the end of the video. But I'll tell you, I've already had a pretty good look at it. I was actually gonna include some of that in our last video, in video number three, but kinda of ran out of time. And at the same time, I didn't really see anything. So we'll have another close look at it here in this video. But my first attempt with a bore scope to see if I could find anything uh, bad with this barrel is coming up empty. Now I will say, as far as I know, Ballistic Advantage has an MOA guarantee. I could go get myself some nice quality factory ammo, maybe a little bit of federal gold medal match or something. And if it won't shoot an inch, I think they'll work with me or they would have worked with Aaron. I don't know if that guarantee would transfer to uh, a secondhand situation like we've got here, but I kind of lost my train of thought there. Yeah, I don't know, this barrel, we're, we're just, we're gonna be quick to pull, pull it out of the gun. I don't wanna waste a bunch of bullets just duplicating tests that Aaron has already done with the barrel. So unless we see some impressive groups today, the barrel's probably coming out. We're gonna talk, talk about it later in the video some more, but you guys came, came up with a bunch of great recommendations for barrels we should look, look into to put into that gun. Now, if you'll remember, we do have another Ballistic Advantage barrel. Ballistic Advantage sent along this 6.5 Creedmoor barrel. This is an extremely similar barrel to the one we've got in the 308. So we're gonna have a second opportunity to see what Ballistic Advantage has got to offer in the accuracy department, but it's gonna be in 6.5 Creedmoor. So that's kind of why we're uh, considering other options for the 308. Okay, let's see, where are we at? The bullets for today. I want to repeat two of the bullets from the last video. The first two, the 168 grain Sierra Match King and the 175 grain Sierra Match King. Next is the 180 grain Hornady SST and the 185 grain Burger Hybrid Target. Then we move up to the 200 grain Sierra Match King and the 208 grain Hornady ELD Match. So this should be a decent look at the heavier side of bullets for the 308. And as far as powders go, I want to stick with the powders I saw show up down in the comments section the most in that last video. These are the, these are extremely common 308 powders and they should all shoot really well. The first is Reloader 15. We're gonna use this powder for the 168 grain and the 175 grain Match King. Now I do wanna shoot two groups with each of these two bullets and use two different charge weights. So hopefully what I've managed to put up here on the screen is 2.8 inches of overall length with both bullets. Both bullets, that gives us about 60 thousandths of jump to the lands. And charge weights are straight from the Sierra load data. 39 and 40 with the 175 grain bullet, 40 and 41 grains with the 168 grain bullet. These should be mild charges. That was another thing about the load in the last video with the 168 grain bullets was a pretty hot load. So I'm hoping this is going to be a little lighter load, a little bit less velocity. Maybe, uh, maybe that'll help with the accuracy. I don't know. Just trying something else here. So those are the first two bullets and the first powder. The next two bullets, I want to shoot Hodgton Varget with these two guys. Now the load data for these guys, the Hornady bullet, I looked in the Hornady manual, the Burger bullet, I looked in the Burger manual. I also looked on the Hodgson website for this weight range of bullets and came up with 40 grains for both bullets. So we'll shoot 40 grains of Varget with both bullets. I only wanna do five shots with each of these two. So only one charge weight here. 
And that's just because I've got 50 pieces of brass ready to go. And that's just how the math worked out. So only five of each of those guys. The next powder is IMR 4064. A lot of people in the comments section said they loved uh, 4064 with a 308. And this is what we're gonna use for the 200 grain Sierra Match King and the 208 grain Hornady ELD Match. Now these, I do wanna shoot two groups with each bullet. So we'll do 38 grains and 39 grains will be our two charge weights for each bullet with IMR 4064. So for primers, just like the last video, I wanna use some CCI number 200, just standard large rifle primers. And the brass is gonna be the same batch from the last video. And if you'll recall, the brass took a little bit of a beating in that last video. So I did go ahead and tumble them just a little bit. You can see they're still maybe just a touch dingy, but I, wanna get, I wanted to get most of the goop off of them so I could give them a really good visual inspection and make sure that none of them got screwed up enough that they should be pulled out. All right, here's a good example. I did have a couple with some significant marks on the side there. These were the ones where in the last video when we were messing around with our gas block and didn't quite have the gun running properly, had a couple get jammed up in the action and end up you know, laying in front of the bolt with the case mouse sticking out the ejection port and they took some pretty good dings on the side. I wanted to have a really good look at those and make sure that none of them had pierced through or made enough of a mark that I should worry about it. And I wasn't able to find anything. There's one piece that has a pretty decent ding on it, but it's not jumping out at me right now. Yeah, I don't know. I can't find it. Now, a lot of you guys reported that what I was seeing with brass and things getting banged up in the last video was not at all unusual and that AR-10s are just rough on brass. That's what, to, that's what we should expect. But I'm gonna continue to tweak on the gas a little bit here in the range portion of today's video, hopefully get this guy running halfway smooth and hopefully we'll shoot some good groups. I'm keeping my hopes up. Maybe this barrel just likes heavy bullets. Oh, one other thing that was asked over on Patreon, somebody had the exact same Seekins gas block that I'm using. So this thing's super simple. If you don't mind, I'd like to zoom in and give like a two minute up close look at this guy and talk about how we adjust it for that gentleman over on Patreon. All right, this should go quick. These guys are pretty darn straightforward. Now what you've got on the side of this guy is the adjustment screw. So actually that, that's the part that, that's pointing back towards the shooter. This is towards the muzzle. So you've got a screw there with, which is your lock, lock screw and this is your adjustment screw. So let's, uh, you just have to back this off a little bit and then you can adjust your adjustment screw. And if I brighten this up enough, there we go. You should be able to see the screw in there and how it's blocking off part of the gas port as it goes in. Now in the last video, I was trying to adjust the block that's on my gun for suppressed use. And where I was, I think I was a, a turn and a half from bottomed out. So I took it, screwed it all the way in, and then backed it out about a turn and a half. So that's about where my gun was sitting in the last video. Now it was still just a touch over gassed when I was suppressed. So just now before I started filming here, I went ahead and turned it down like eh, about a quarter of a turn. So I'm gonna continue to tweak on it a little bit here as this video goes along, but that's, that's the basics of it. That's your adjustment screw. This is your lock screw. Let me pull it all the way out for you here. There it is, and you'll see it's got a brass tip, nice and soft. So you can feel free to uh, crank down halfway decent on your lock, your lock screw. These Seekins blocks are pretty cheap. The, the, the biggest problem is the adjustment being on the side. And if your hand guard happens to cover that part, you're, you're out of luck a little bit. And here's what that looks like on my upper. And you can see the scratches here already where I've been trying to get in there with this guy. And the rail's in the way just a little bit, man. So that sucks a little bit and that's definitely a downside to these Seekins blocks, but they're pretty cheap. Here's another option I've used on a couple guns recently. This is the Odin Works uh, basic, they call it a tunable gas block. A couple cool things about it. I like how it's got that index mark, helps with aligning your uh, gas block during installation. I dig that. And then in this guy, it uses the same hole for the lock screw and the adjustment screw. So wrong one, there we go. So you pull out the first screw yeah, and there's another one behind it, which this, yeah, it reached. So that's how this guy locks into place. It's, it, it's all adjustable from the front. This guy smushes onto this guy to lock it. I haven't really noticed it getting boogered up. I've got a couple of these and they're doing okay. These are also pretty cheap. The, I think the reason I ordered the Seekins last time is these were out of stock. So that's it, man. Let's get some ammo loaded. 
All right, our first step is going to be to resize our brass. So I've got my fooling sizing die here. It comes out of a Redding Deluxe die set. It's always done just fine. The good thing about, uh, about shooting something like 308 is that everybody's been making 308 dies for 100 years. So everybody's had their time to work out the kinks, wouldn't you think? So it doesn't really matter what sort of die you're using. Now, for what we learned in the last video was that the size of our headspace here in this Ballistic Advantage barrel is, is, is between my Tika and my Savage. 308s and I've used this die quite a quite a bit to resize for those guns and the setting here should be pretty close So luckily we've got the Hornady headspace comparator kit and it looks like 1.625 inches is our number here and that's fire formed to our chamber So all of your pieces of brass should look the same if it's already been fired in your gun So if we set up the die without using the comparator usually the instructions say screw the die down until it touches the shell holder and a lot of them say to drop the ram and go an additional little bit. So let, let's size a piece like that. So that's pretty pretty decent contact between the shell holder and our die. I'm using the uh, Redding Imperial Sizing Die Wax. Let's see where this guy comes out. What I'm seeing here with the first piece is 1.624. Occasionally it'll show you 1.623, but 1.624 is what I'm seeing. So we might need to go even just a little bit farther on our die. So we're only bumping the shoulder 1,000th. Let's, let's do another piece here. Double check the before number, 1.625. Now this one is closer to what I expected. This is 1.620. So the shoulder on this guy is showing that it got bumped 5 thousandths. What did I do wrong on the first one? Yeah, it reads 1.624. Let me put this piece back through the die one more time. Maybe I'm losing my marbles here. And... Yeah, it's in there. It's all the way in there. So let's... 1.622. Let's do one more piece. This brass has never been annealed. That might be part of what's going on here, is this stuff is just screaming to be annealed, and each piece is springing back and coming out a little bit different because the brass is a little bit hard. 1.621, 1.619. You know, another thing that could be a possibility is some of these were fired in my Tika, some of them were fired in my Savage, so maybe they're yeah, maybe their different lineage is, is coming into play. I don't know. 1.621. We'll just stick with this setting. And assuming this brass survives one more firing, which I don't see why it wouldn't, we'll try annealing them the next time we use them. Just double check the case length to be sure. These aren't going to need trimmed this time. I trimmed them before the previous firing in the last video. So I just need to get these guys resized, get the lube wiped off of them, and then we can move on. So my Forster Ultra Micrometer Seating Die is still in the press from the last video. And the last bullet we seeded in that video was the 175 grain Sierra Match King, I think. So I think the 168 grain Sierra Match King, which is what we're going to seat here first, has basically the same ogive. So uh, I'm not going to back up very much. That's like uh, 30 or 40 thousandths. Let's dial this guy into 2.8 inches of overall length. I can't believe I did this, but I should have checked my bullet boxes before I, yeah, 2.832. But okay, back, back to what I was saying. I can't ever focus, can I? Um, this 168 green Sierra Match King, I've only got nine of them. I thought I had uh, plenty. I thought I actually thought I had a couple more boxes. 2.803. The next one's 2.803. I'm gonna bump this guy down three thousandths and call it good enough. So this first load here, is going to be a four shot group. So, yeah. And it's the same situation with the 200 grain 
Match King. I've only got nine of those. We'll, we'll have some, some, we'll have a couple of four shot groups and then we'll have a couple of six shot groups as I just move a few, uh, as I move a few things around. So our next bullet being the 175 grain Match King. I think I can use the same die setting pretty much. Let's see if it's pretty close. 2.797. Hopefully I just caught a short bullet there, but if we're a couple thousandths short on overall length, nothing to worry about. Yeah, the next one's 2.798. So this is pretty much it. I just need to seed some bullets, weigh some more powder, seed some more bullets, and repeat. So I think we'll just call it done here, and I'll see you guys out on the range. Okay, so we're set up just like we were in the last video. We've got a target at 100 yards. I've got my Caldwell chronograph sitting out about, I don't know, eight feet from the muzzle maybe 10 feet. Now, since the last time we fired this gun, I did pull the handguard off. I pulled off the gas block and the gas tube and retorqued the barrel nut. So last video, the, bar the barrel nut was at about 80 foot pounds and now it's at 65 foot pounds like it should be. I don't think that's gonna make any difference, but it only took a minute and it was, uh, yeah, an easy thing to fix. The other thing I did, while I had it all apart, I did go ahead and take the Dremel tool and grind off a little bit of the barrel nut so that I could make 100% sure that the, the gas tube is making it past that barrel nut with no interference. So I think it was fine before, but now I'm 100% sure. Another thing I always like to watch out for in this situation, I had this all torn apart, the scope was off, the barrel was off, it was all completely apart, and now it's all back together. Hopefully it's still zeroed. And that makes me feel good when I tear something apart, put it back together, and it's just like it was before. So we'll be on the lookout for that. I mentioned we're at 100 yards, right? Shooting off a bipod and a rear bag. Our first load is going to be 40 grains of Reloader 15 with the 168 grain Sierra Match King. This is gonna be a four shot group. This is 40 grains as first. So let's see if this bullet does any better than it did in the last video. All right, compared to what we saw in the last video, that is an excellent group. Much better than we saw last time. I'm still a little bit overgassed. I need to make another gas block adjustment, but I forgot to bring out my tools. Eh, we'll get to that here in a little bit. Next up is 41.0 grains of Reloader 15. All right, that's another halfway decent group. I mean, let's not get carried away. Not exactly impressive, but it's not bad. Good, I'm gonna go get the tools to adjust my gas block and give this guy a minute to cool down a little bit. All right, so I got my gas turned down a little bit, and while I was grabbing the tools, I went ahead and grabbed the large chamber chiller. That's not gonna focus right. Yeah, there we go. And the large chamber chiller does fit into the AR-10. It's a very, very tight fit. Kind of got to coax it in there a little bit but it does fit and I'm going to go ahead and use it for the rest of the video just to help keep things a little bit cool. All right so we're switching bullets over to the 175 grain Match King that actually shot pretty well in the last video. So let's see how they shoot with with uh, Reloader 15 first up 39.0 grains. All right, that's another respectable group. Maybe not quite where we want to be, but still not too shabby. Next up is 40 grains. The gas adjustment I made is just about right. That was an immediate uh, reduction in recoil. Like it felt like the, uh, the bolt was cycling just about the right amount and that recoil got a whole lot smoother. Plus our brass was going to right about three o'clock. So hopefully that's the gas situation figured out. Now this next group is one of those weird uh, six shot groups. So six shots, let's see what it does. Actually, my chronograph battery just died, so I wanna go ahead and eject this guy. And I need to go get a battery. Okay, let's try this again.
Okay, so it's time to switch bullets and powders. Next up is the 180 grain Hornady SST. The powder is Varget, the charge is 40.0 grains. All right, that's a pretty mediocre showing for the SST, but still not awful. Next up is the 185 grain Burger Hybrid Target. These guys have a lot of jump. We're jumping 220 thousandths to the lands, but I think the hybrid ogive design of these bullets is supposed to be jump tolerant. So let's find out. All right, here we go. Still shooting 40 grains of Varget. All right, so the burger had a little double grouping sort of thing going on. Kind of continued our theme of mediocrity here today, which is a huge step up, right? I'm not, uh, I'm not feeling down about it. I'll take mediocre performance over the crap we saw in the last video any day of the week. So yeah, spirits up. We're switching bullets and powder again. This is the 200 grain Sierra Match King. The powder is IMR 4064, and the first charge weight is 38.0 grains. Ah, uh, but for that one shot, that was a halfway decent group. Uh, did I forget to mention that was a four shot group? Yeah, that's another one of the weird ones. That's a four shot group. Let me gather up the brass. Okay, so this next one is going to be a five shot group. This is 39.0 grains of 4064. All right, so the wheels kind of came off there at 39 grains with the 200 grain Sierra Match King. That sucks, man. I was really hoping maybe that 200 grain Sierra Match King would just stack them right in there. So one more bullet to test. We're still shooting IMR 4064. This is the 208 grain Hornady ELD Match. We're shooting the same charge weights that we shot with the 200 grain Sierra Match King, which means first up is 38.0. This is going to be a six shot group. Uh-oh, got a little failure to feed here. Yeah, the case didn't get banged up too bad. And just eyeballing the overall length, it doesn't look like the bullet got set back. So let's keep shooting. Looks like I went just a little bit too low on the gas, perhaps. All right, that's a pretty rough start for the 208 ELD match. Five more shots to go. This is our last group. It's 39.0 grains. Ah, one last malfunction to finish things off, it looks like. Yeah, it also didn't get banged up too bad, so let's shoot it. All right, so this is definitely a better looking target than we had in the last video, but I don't know if it's quite good enough. So let's pack up, get back to the bench, talk it out.
All right, let's start things off with a look at the brass. And let's do it by powder. The first four rows were Reloader 15, the middle two were Varget, and the last four were IMR 4064. Let's start off with Reloader 15, or I'll pick some from the higher charge here. All right, if I can get enough goop off of there so we can see it, these are in really, really good shape. There's no burrs raised up, and that really continued through all of the Reloader 15 stuff. We got our gas pretty, uh, pretty close, so case mouths nice and round, no dings on the side of the cases. So getting the gas tuned in has cleared up all of our problems up here, and we're left looking at the case head. Let me grab a couple more here from Reloader 15. I just actually drug my finger over all four rows to see if I could find one that raised up any type of a burr and was not able to find any. So Reloader 15, outstanding stuff, no problems at all. Now here are a couple cases from some Varget, and we started seeing a, little, a few more nicks and dings here on the case head. It's not bad, but it's not quite as good as Reloader 15. Again, the case bodies and the case mouths and stuff are still good. And the case heads really here with Varget are good as well. Just maybe not quite as good as Reloader 15. Now, when we make the move to IMR 4064, this is where all hell kind of breaks loose. Really bad ejector marks and, and these big old burrs, right? It reminds me of the 22 nozzle brass. If you guys remember that series where we had so many brass problems. So things just immediately got much worse with 4064. And it is pretty much every piece of brass has got these raised up burrs. And once again, you know, velocities were nice and low. That guy got a little bit of a ding on the case mouth. Nothing terrible. So this makes me think that uh, IMR 4064 might not be a good choice here. Now, I think the burn rate of 4064 is between Reloader 15 and Varget. I don't know, let me pull it up here real quick. Hang on. No, actually, now that I look it up, 4064 is the fastest of, the, of these three powders, but they're all right next to one another on the burn rate chart between 90, number 96 and number 102. Another thing to remember from our 4064 groups were the malfunctions, right? We had a couple failures to feed. So 4064 just didn't have the gas port pressure that Reloader 15 and Varget did, I guess. Now, maybe if we turned up the gas a little bit to compensate, maybe our brass starts looking a little bit better. This is one of the topics, I mean, I'm really looking forward to exploring in the AR-10 is how picky it is about different powders. So yeah, this was just unexpected. I expected similar gas from all three of these powders. I don't know. It's going to be fascinating to explore the world of powders as we go forward here with the with the AR-10. I'll tell you what, now that I, since I've got the camera set up like this, let me go ahead and give you a quick look at the bolt carrier group and we'll tear apart the bolt and all of that junk. It was definitely brought up in the comments that I might need to do a little bit of work here to the bolt face to clean up some rough edges, but at least the, uh, the bolt face and the rounded ejector and stuff doesn't look too bad. And on the extractor side of things, not a whole lot of sharp edges here either. Maybe I could clean up a little bit of those peaks there, but it doesn't look too aggressive. Looks pretty good. Now, when I was tearing this apart, I was blown away here. This guy goes double O-rings and then a spring and another spring inside of the spring. So they got some serious force there on the backside of this extractor. Pretty wild. So yeah, I don't know. Especially since we saw such good, uh, good looking brass with Reloader 15 and Varget, I'm not gonna screw around with the bolt yet. It definitely might come to that eventually, but I wanna do a little bit more testing, try a few more powders and just learn as much as we can. All of the parts here, like uh, not seeing any wear here at a hundred rounds, this was just a wipe off. You guys know how this can get crusted up really bad and stuff. So the finish here on the bolt and also the bolt carrier, it was worth, I think this was, like 10 bucks more than their standard bolt and bolt carrier. So it was worth it just for uh, for easy cleanup. Yep, even there, not seeing much. So things are holding up nicely here. Good stuff. Okay, let's have a look at our groups from today. Our best group was the first one, and then it was all downhill from there. The first group was also the only group we shot today that was under an inch. And it was barely under an inch, not 0.986. Now, except for the last three groups, we kind of hung out in that inch to 1.6 seven inch sort of range, which I guess isn't too bad. I just expect better performance here, like especially these particular powders and we're shooting good bullets. I thought we might see some good groups today and it just didn't happen. Now, is it coincidence that IMR 4064 had function problems and it tore up our brass and it also shot the worst groups? I don't know. Coincidence? 
can't really be sure at this point. Now overall though, if we look at the groups from today and the groups from the last video, which I guess in the last video we did have a couple where we shot some with the suppressor, some without the suppressor, so a couple of the groups are, aren't quite as bad as they look, but they're all still really quite bad. So today was significantly better, especially with Reloader 15 and Varget. Now what I want to do next, let's go ahead and set up the bore scope and we'll just look around. I've, I cleaned the upper, I cleaned the barrel so that we could have a look at it, so it might as well. Now I didn't go overboard with cleaning, just a couple patches with some hoppies, about 10 strokes with the bronze brush, and then a few more uh, patches with some hoppies, right? So some very, very basic cleaning. So let's get set up. Let's see what it looks like. All right, I think I finally found a camera position that won't have glare, and I've been screwing around with the color on my camera, trying to get it to where it'll show up properly. So I don't know. All right, so let's see. Let's start at the beginning, just entering the chamber. So really nothing weird going on in the chamber. We haven't seen anything weird on our brass. So not a whole lot going on there. And then we're up, let's see, that's the shoulder and the neck. And then there is the end of the neck and the start of the barrel. So like that's the lead and there's some rifling. So let's go back here to the end of the neck where the barrel starts. There is a little bit of fire cracking. Doesn't look bad to me. If you watched my video on this Lyman bore cam, you will have seen the fire cracking in my uh, 6.5 Creedmoor bolt rifle. This is nothing like that. Like this is uh, not even close to that, but maybe just a touch. A little bit of carbon there built up. I need to uh, keep an eye on that. Definitely clean it out. Next chance I get, I've always heard you just grab a uh, oversized brush, a little bit of JB on there and that stuff will spin right out. So moving forward to the lead and the start of the rifling, I don't see anything weird going on here, at least to my untrained eye. Pick a rifling land and kind of follow it down a little bit. I'm not seeing any significant buildup or anything like that. Definitely a little bit of tooling marks in this barrel, but again, nothing like the uh, 6.5 Creedmoor Thompson center barrel we recently scoped that had really distinct tooling marks throughout the length of the barrel. And that's an awesome shooting barrel, by the way. So let me run down, see if I can find the gas port. Should be right around in this region. There it is. So the muzzle end is to the left. The chamber is to the right. Looks pretty similar to a lot of the other gas ports we've scoped with a little bit of erosion on the muzzle end. It just dawned on me. I don't think Aaron ever told me how many rounds he had on this barrel. So I've just been searching around here looking to see if I could find anything else interesting and I'm not coming up with much. So let me flip the gun around. Now there's a little bit of carbon fouling it looks like right around the middle of the barrel. Well, let me flip the gun around. We'll have a look at the crown. All right, here we go. See if we can get a look at the crown. Yeah, the light from the camera is really kind of glaring a lot. Let me, I always have the hardest time getting a look at the crown due to glare, but there it is. Let's see if we can have a look at it. Now, another uh, viewer, commenter on the last video offered to recrown this barrel. So that definitely might be worthwhile. I haven't really looked at enough barrels yet to get a good feel, but I don't see any major defects here, like no big nicks or scratches, but there are some spots that are maybe a little bit rough. I don't know if that's some leftover carbon fouling that I didn't quite get. Yeah, I'm not sure. Now up here at the end, there's a good example. This is right at the end of the barrel, definitely a little bit of, car of uh, copper. And this whole end of the barrel has got a little bit of streaky copper. There's a little nick in one of the lands up on this end of the barrel. Nothing crazy, but it's kind of on the lookout for anything here and not coming up with much. Just looks like a barrel. There we go. There's an angle on the crown. Maybe they'll give us a decent look. Yeah, if you actually get it to where like there's a little bit of glare, a little bit of uh, light shining off of it, it looks a whole lot more uniform <laughs> that way than when you kind of redirect the light. So it might, it might just be a little bit of carbon fouling there that's making it maybe look a little bit more ragged than it is. I, I don't even know what the hell I'm saying, but all right, enough of this crap. So I think we need to wrap this thing up. This will be the conclusion of our build series, right? The four videos of that focused on the gun itself. At this point, I'm very happy with the Aero Precision M5E1 setup platform, the builder set, and all of the parts that I got went together very well. I'm happy with the fit and finish. A Little bit of trigger trouble along the way, but I think we finally settled in on this two pound, four pound CMC trigger. It feels good. 
It feels really good. Now this is not where we end things. You know, we've got a lemon barrel, right? Our, our barrel's crap. With the 100 rounds we've shot so far, we should have seen much better accuracy. So this barrel's gonna come out. Like I mentioned, we had an offer to recrown it. So maybe, uh, maybe I'll ship this guy off, get it recrowned, and we'll test it again later. I don't know. But I think what we'll definitely do is just go ahead and buy a different 308 barrel for this upper. Now we've got another ballistic advantage barrel. We've got the 20 inch 6.5 Creedmoor. So if you're looking at ballistic advantage barrels, do not let this, our performance in these last two videos with this barrel be your guide. This was, this was a donated barrel. It was always supposed to shoot bad. I don't know its history. So if you're looking for more information on ballistic advantage barrels, we'll have the second upper here within just a couple weeks. We'll start shooting 6.5 Creedmoor in the AR-10 with that barrel. And if that barrel shoots well, we'll just consider this one a fluke. I've also got a 300 Blackout Ballistic Advantage barrel that shoots well. So I'm not gonna let this one barrel turn me against Ballistic Advantage and I hope you guys won't either. So on to the next barrel. That's what's important. That's the next big decision we need to make. I wanna run a couple poles. The first question we need to answer is barrel length. This is an 18 inch barrel. We went with a 20 inch barrel in 6.5 Creedmoor. I'm kind of tempted to go with a, with a 20 inch barrel in 308 as well. But then again, 18 is a pretty handy package as well. So that'll be the first poll. If you're watching here on YouTube, you might see a bubble popping up here in the top right hand corner, a little circle with an eye in it, I believe. You click on there, you'll be able to see the poles. The first one is gonna be length. The options are gonna be 18 inches, 20 inches, or something else. The second poll is gonna be about barrel brand. You guys gave me a lot of excellent feedback in, uh, in the comment section of the last video. And these uh, YouTube polls only allow you to have five different choices. So here are the five that jump out at me. The first and probably the most recommended was, the, uh, was a Criterion barrel. They sell some over at Optics Planet. They've got, an, they've got an 18 inch and a 20 inch, but the problem is the 20 inch is a one in 11 twist. I'd really like to stick with a one in, ten, one in 10 twist barrel. So we've got the option to experiment with heavy bullets. So the 18 inch barrel at Optics Planet is looking pretty good, but for a 20 inch option over at Fulton Armory, they offer a, a 20 inch one in 10 twist. And I think it uses an 875 gas block like our 6.5 Creedmoor barrel is going to. So that's gonna be option one, Criterion, or Criterion. I don't know, that's option one, looking at about 320 to 335 bucks. A little over 300. Option number two is over at Midway, they have got some drop-in shillings. I've always heard good things about shilling barrels. Just a little bit pricey. It's $490, but it does come with a matched head-spaced bolt. They've got 18 and 20 inches, so we're good to go there. That's not a bad option, especially with that ma with that matched bolt. Now, all of these all of these companies, I think we could buy a a, a, a head spaced bolt with the barrel if we wanted to, but at least for the shilling, it comes with one. So I'll list that guy in the poll as shilling. The next option are the Faxon Match Series barrels. They've got 18 or 20 inches. They're both one in 10 twist. That's the same barrel I went with for uh, 6.5 Grendel recently, and that's been a pretty good shooting barrel in the Grendel. It's been a little bit tricky. It has a little bit more uh, shift than I would like whenever I put the suppressor on, but otherwise it's been a good shooting barrel. We've shot some really good groups in the last couple 6.5 Grendel videos. So I wouldn't hesitate to give one of their AR-10 barrels a try. Over there, we're looking at 340 to $350. They are fluted and they are super light. Those barrels, the 20 incher is only 2.4 pounds, where a lot of these barrels we're looking at are, are four plus pounds. So we could save a couple pounds going with the Faxon, and some of these other, you know, some of these other companies probably also offer fluted options that are lighter, but at least with the Faxon Match Series, they only sell them fluted. So that'll be the third option, Faxon. Black Hole Weaponry, which if you go to their site, I guess they're now branded Columbia River Arms. Their stuff looks pretty cool. Like it is totally customizable. You kind of go through and pick exactly what barrel length and twist and gas system length and stuff like that. It's kind of a build to order custom things. They don't have one in 10 twist, but they've got one, one in 9.73 twist. They didn't want to round that up to 10. So totally customizable and pretty sweet looking. That'll be in the poll as black hole weaponry. The other option I want to add to the poll is proof research. Now this is kind of funny because in the last video where I first brought up the fact that the smart move might be to switch barrels, 
Proof Research is what I use as an example of uh, a little too pricey. They're like their carbon fiber barrels are a thousand bucks, but Midway does sell a Proof Research stainless drop-in for $479. I think they only had an 18 inch one in 10 twist. So yeah, I don't know if a 20 inch is going to be available in the Proof Research. We can look around, probably come up with some, probably come up with one somewhere. So that'll be Proof Research in the poll. This is not an all-inclusive list. We'll take today's poll and maybe the maybe the one or two that get the least number of votes will vote them off the island and bring in some other companies. We're, we'll talk about this as we go along. We'll have additional videos before I actually order the uh, the barrel. But I also saw like the some people reported the yeah, the, the DPMS SASS barrel. A couple people said they had that and it worked well. Wilson Combat was brought up a couple times. Excalibur was brought up a couple times. I think Excalibur is kind of similar to Black Hole Weaponry where you go in, you pick the barrel length, you pick your twist rate, you pick your gas system length, and it's pretty customizable. So that's that's what we'll go with for now. Let me know what you think, and we'll have, uh, we'll have more follow-up videos on the subject. But at least here for our initial build series, this is over. I will have a new playlist. That's one thing I don't mention nearly enough. Like I, I'm very careful when I add new videos to organize things into playlists. So like I've got a 308 playlist that includes these videos and I've got an AR-10 playlist that I've started up. Anytime you're trying to navigate my channel and looking for caliber specific information, looking through my playlists is generally the easiest way to, uh, to get to the information you're looking for. All right, folks, I'm rambling. So it's time to wrap this up. Thanks again to everyone who has been a supporter of this. This was 100% funded by viewers and I sincerely appreciate it. So that's it for now. I'll see you next time.